This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 484, for Wednesday, September 4th, 2024. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we're into. The podcast is available on all major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please consider subscribing, liking, following, checking that button that says, hey, I'd like to have more of this in my life. It really does help us out a lot. Joining me this week is my friend Johnny, who you may know better as Pixel Riffs on the internet and on YouTube, and of course, all the social media that matters. Johnny, of course, is my co-host on the Spawn Chunks podcast, and the last time that Johnny was on the show was earlier this year on episode 478, where we talked about the Netflix live-action adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender, as well as, of course, last year for the first season premiere of Rings of Power, and that is why he is back today. Hello, sir. Hello, it's me, Pixel Riffs, the Lord of Gifts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, my gift to you today is, I guess, my presence on this podcast seems a bit presumptuous, but hey, what's up? It's been only six episodes this time since I'm back on the show. I feel like that's, uh, yeah, I'm, do I'm doing pretty well this time, at making regular appearances. I think in part, there hasn't been a great deal of stuff to talk about that I didn't want to talk about in such a negative light so like i was thinking about doing like a blow by blow of the acolyte and we all know how that went and yeah it's uh -huh. tough when something that you're excited about ends up keep being kind of crappy and you're just like well i don't want to do week after week of just complaining because it like it, it's yeah. not it's not fun yeah. to listen to um and there's a certain level of like star wars fans that are just out there complaining for the sake of complaining and i didn't want to get lumped in with them and all that stuff uh but I, I feel like the, the the fantasy realm is starting to redeem our uh, lack of, of sci-fi. Although I, I have to say, uh, Stephen and I had a really good chat last episode about uh, Deadpool and Wolverine. That mm -hmm. was that was a really good sci-fi comic book movie adventure. And just we really didn't have much bad to say about it. It was just a good, fun ride. So I feel like we're getting back into the stride. And, and of course, uh, I think as you and I have talked about in the pre-show on the sponge chunks, the weather is shifting very quickly. I was uh, walking with a hoodie to the gym the other day. I've closed windows this morning around the house because yeah. it's chilly. I'm sensing the cozy movie fall, you know, the cozy series uh, <laughs> yes, yes. happening. And uh, if anything, given that you and I are going to be talking about Rings of Power a little bit later today, uh, I've been itching to watch Lord of the Rings. I haven't watched Lord of the Rings since I got my new TV, I don't think. So it's been uh -huh. since the lockdown and COVID. And I used to watch it like once a year. And I don't know why I've held off. I think it's because there's no 4K extended version streaming. I have to watch yeah, like my sure, blue I have sure. to watch my Blu-rays. And in one way that might be okay. Like the the upscaling on my TV might make those look a little bit better because if they're in 4K with effects from 2001 <laughs> like it, it might be like ooh, that's a little that's a little bit too much detail on something that's not supposed to be looked at in 4k so yeah in, in that regard the lord of the rings dvds might be better off as 1080p blu-ray but we'll have to see but i'm looking forward to getting into it more because i've been kind of steeped in this the last uh, week or so as the series premiered but before we get into all that i mean it has been a little while since you've been on the show what have you been up to lately like what's new in your geeky life well, we talk about Minecraft every week on a Monday, so I won't talk about Minecraft that much here. I mean, the only thing I've been doing Minecraft-wise of note, or at least related to the topic of today's show, is the Fantasy Minecraft SMP, which obviously has a fair amount of stuff that's inspired by fantasy culture in general, and so there's probably a couple of Lord of the Rings references snuck in there. There certainly seem to be a lot of rings. Um, they, they convey various benefits and stuff, but outside of that... Um, I've been playing through Elden Ring, so more rings, just rings popping up everywhere in my life right now. Um, I've played through Elden Ring a lot previously, 
um, maybe beat the game two or three times, the DLC came out for it. And having never been part of like a Dark Souls from software DLC drop at any point, this was my first time like really going into it fresh with everybody else. Although it did come out around the time that I went on holiday to the States most recently. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's not quite like, you know, I didn't get the full hype experience along with everybody else. But now I'm doing this weird challenge on Twitch where I wanted to play through the game with every weapon in alphabetical order, which is difficult for a game like Elden Ring because it has over 300 weapons just in the base game and another 100 in the DLC. So I decided on this ridiculous challenge because it was getting a bit of hype, so I wanted to play it on Twitch a little bit more. But I always find myself playing the game the same way, sort of the same as I imagine people do with games like Minecraft, where you always start the world by getting a starter house, going mining, finding iron, finding diamonds, the same sort of thing. In Elden Ring, I'd always go and beat these two enemies that I knew would give me a load of experience that I could use to level up my character, and then I'd go and grab this weapon that allowed me to get through this, that, and the other boss really fast, and then I'd find myself halfway through the game going, hang on, I'm playing this exactly the same way. So... I'm sort of forcing myself by using the alphabetical list of weapons that's on the Elden Ring wiki to make my way through a bunch of different playstyles. It started out with a, a spellcasting playstyle that I was less familiar with, and then colossal weapons, the kind of thing that's like where you're hitting somebody with a sword that's the size of a small truck that like I'd never used before because I like to be able to attack like quickly and dodge quickly and those weapons are all about weight and having like a swing that nothing can interrupt because you know you start swinging that sword you're gonna finish swinging the sword and so I've been through I think eight weapons so far I'm on my ninth playthrough and the ninth one I have to beat the game using a crossbow and it turns out crossbows can't really be leveled up in any meaningful way, so I'm stuck doing a very low amount of damage and trying to find all of the little ways that the game can give you like a free pass to doing more damage. Like if you can cast a, a buff on yourself that does more attack damage overall, that also applies to the crossbow, where like scaling up your character's strength and vitality does absolutely nothing to what the crossbow does in terms of damage. So there's some really interesting systems in that game that I'm trying to get to grips with, whilst trying to just beat the entire game, which can run you maybe 30 to 60 hours if you play it through in a normal way, but because I know the critical path through the game, I know which bosses I have to beat to progress, I'm down to about like 12 to 15 hours on average per playthrough now, so I'm getting through it. But each playthrough is different because I take a different route to find the weapon from starting with a fresh character, and then I often find myself getting weapons and abilities that support the main weapon for the playthrough, and every character turns out different. So it's a surprisingly robust system, even though the game itself follows the same linear story every time. I would have not thought that of Elden Ring. I would have thought there would have been like a, a story and a, and a plot of defeating bosses through the game, and then once you were done, you were done. I didn't realize there was so much replayability. And really cool that the developer has mechanics in the game where if you do decide to choose something like a crossbow, there are other things that could still make you feel powerful and level up and capable rather than, I guess, handing out the choice where like, well, you chose a crossbow and tough luck. You can't beat this boss yeah. with a crossbow. <laughs> like you're just, you're forcing you to do something else that is a little bit more, I don't want to say cookie cutter, but like a little, what people expect a little bit more, which is like a sword and a shield or a pike weapon or like something that feels a little bit more powerful uh, and flashy and having to use that being forced to use a weapon like that to defeat a certain boss so i i've never played elder ring i've watched you play it a little bit and i've seen some highlight reels uh some of the people that i follow on youtube force gaming is one enjoys these kinds of games and will often have like highlight reels as he's talking about it and i've always found it challenging to play games that have that kind of timing where yeah you have yeah. to dodge a attack uh, just because you blocked doesn't mean you'll block uh, depending on what attack is coming from the boss because this is like a souls like game right that's what it would be classified as yeah it's 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 from the same developers as the dark souls series so it's sort of yeah. like the spiritual successor to that series mm -hmm. but a bit more open world a bit more dark fantasy than like purely gothic horror i was trying to remember the title of it i played one recently that was on game pass and 
you used a lantern to kind of see between worlds and you could use that to then figure out how to open a door, how to get through a passage. Yeah, so there are more like puzzle solving elements in that respect. Yeah, yeah but there, but it was the same sort of mechanic of like, if you weren't paying attention and you got hit twice, like you are owned. And, and if you yeah. don't have any health or anything like that, like it's, it's really kind of like a one to three hits and you're dead sort of situation. And then you'd go all the way back to the beginning of whatever that level was. And I was just like, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't really enjoy super punishing mechanics like that. Like if I'm going to die and I'm going to die harshly, fine. Can I at least like have like a save point or a grave that's only like the beginning of the room or the beginning of that encounter uh, to go over again? It's, um, but I think for me, I mean, these are wildly different games, but Borderlands 3 was like that. In, in that if you died at the boss, you'd be regenerated just before you got to the boss, not way back yeah, at the beginning yeah. of all the level. Because especially if you were good enough where the the mobs that you encounter along the way are really no trouble for you, then it just becomes like a time sink as opposed to you have to be good enough to get through this and beat the boss. It's more like, well, no, now you just have to have the time to get through this and beat the boss again. And that's where yeah. I kind of fell off. I'm going to look up the title of that game just so I can remember it. Cause I know it visually, it was very cool. It was very creepy. It felt very Elden Ring slash Lord of the Rings like. Yeah. You mentioned um, Lords of the Fallen on the spawn chunks recently. I don't know if it was that the, the lantern mechanic doesn't ring a bell for me. So I'm just trying to remember what other games you've mentioned lately. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That's Lords yeah. of the Fallen. Okay. I think it was a lantern. It's, it's more like a, like your life force is dangling from your belt. Like you are not necessarily a human. You, you are some sort of a resurrected warrior. And so mm -hmm. the, the lantern serves as like the point of which your soul is re reincarnated from, but it also gives you the ability to look through the world. A power of the unseen world, as they might say in Rings of Power. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wanted to, to like it. It's just that I, I found that I'm just not good enough to enjoy it, I guess. Um, and so I've, I've tended to go towards more arcadey yeah. type stuff in, in my non-Minecraft gameplay. Yeah, those games are a bit of an acquired taste. Um, there's a couple of games out right now that basically everyone who was part of the Elden Ring community is playing for, I guess, a bit of a break from the, the Dark Souls formula, but sticking with the same kind of gameplay. And Black Myth Wukong is a really popular one on Twitch right now. That's based on the kind of Journey to the West fable, the sort of ancient Chinese story. Um, so that's got similar, like, big boss fight, kind of massive set piece, uh, very combat-focused gameplay and uh, an open world for you to explore. Although I've heard, I listened to the Besties podcast talk about this. They said it's like the open world gameplay, the kind of minute-to-minute -minute running around getting to the areas they felt was kind of skippable. It was much more about just getting to the big action set pieces and progressing the story, and it felt more of a linear experience as a result, whereas Elden Ring like, encourages you to explore because more often than not, the boss that's standing in your way is probably a few levels above where you're at when you can first reach them, and so it's a lot more about going and getting the tools that you need to beat them and getting the, uh, the levels in the meantime. But once you've got a bit of experience, you can breeze through that stuff. So people are still getting to grips with Black Myth Wukong. Uh, Star Wars Outlaws is the other thing I've seen a lot of people play. And I haven't looked into exactly what that is, but it seems like, again, more of an open world game, but you're, uh, you know, a an outlaw, a rebel sort of on the fringes of a community that's being, you know, taken over by the Empire and you're sort of messing with stormtroopers and stuff from the gameplay that I've seen. But I don't know quite how deep it gets and how tied into the rest of the... Uh, the sort of Skywalker saga story it ends up being. I've seen that uh, advertised and, and a lot of people reviewing it as well. And it's from what I can tell you are a smuggler. I watched the Xbox like 10 minute game developer preview during Gamescom this summer, I think. And you're, you're part of that outlaw world. And so you can uh, increase your standing with different syndicates. So there's the hut syndicate. There's the, a couple of other syndicates that I can't remember the names of from different Star Wars lore. And so you can decide to be good, bad, and somewhere gray in between. And ultimately you still, you know, obviously don't want to run in with the empire because they're trying to, to rule everything. And from what yeah. I can tell, it's, it's, it's happening within the timeline of the Skywalker saga, but there doesn't seem to be any Skywalker tie-ins. I mean, as far as I know, I haven't seen any giant spoilers yet for the story. Um, but it looks like and and looks like it plays very similar to something like an Assassin's Creed 
But right. Then, yeah. But then also like Control. Did you ever play Control? Uh, I didn't, but I saw people play it. I, I like the aesthetic of that game a lot, but I didn't have the right sort of set up to play it at the yeah. time. Yeah, there's a little Batman Arkham Asylum in there too. Like basically you've got this little sidekick character, a little, um, looks like an axolotl with fur and you can send him out to like distract a stormtrooper so you can sneak behind them and, and take them out or just sneak behind them in general. Uh, you can kind of use his, he's got like some sort of ability that allows you to see people that are behind walls and stuff so very similar to like batman using his his um sonar thing to like see where the bad guys are as you kind of navigate a, a a puzzle to try and get through and rescue somebody without being detected like that kind of stuff um but then there's also speeder bike chases you can pilot a ship uh in in the game and so it i don't know like when i looked at it i thought like the game is trying to do a lot i wonder if it's going to do all of those things okay or if it's going to focus on one thing and do that very well and then have yeah. these other things as just like little interstitial bits between. Um, but we'll, we'll see. It looks really cool. Uh, there's, there's something I find strange about games that try to be a little bit too realistic sometimes, like the, the hair and the movement. Like things just tend to move when they shouldn't move. And it always just kind of reminds me that it's a video game. And um, I, uh, I've noticed that about the main character's hair. Like it, it just looks like they could have gone something with something a little bit more simple. I find it kind of distracting in the clips yeah. that, that I've seen, but, uh, but it looks, it looks like fun. Uh, the other game that I, I couldn't remember was uh Wo long and that's not like a deep fantasy Lord of the Rings type game, but it had the same mechanics, the same sort of like timing mechanics and stuff where you're fighting the uh, ancient Chinese horrors and, and things. And, uh, that was the other game I tried on, on game pass. And I have to say, I do like game pass for this feature in that I tried the Lord of the Fallen's, I tried Wolong and I didn't like either of them and it's no skin off my nose. Like I was paying the sure, yeah, 10 yeah, bucks yeah. a month or whatever it is for my console game pass. And I can then just go back to playing something that I have and I have had for a long, long time on game pass, like Forza or No Man's Sky or something like that. And I have a few others. There's a few new ones that came out recently that I want to try, but, but yeah, it's, it seems to be a really good time for gaming. There's a lot of really cool stuff that was announced. There's some indie games that I've, I've caught my eye that are coming out and, I um I didn't sit down and like note any titles, but just Gamescom seemed to have a very positive response from a lot of people that I I follow online. Yeah, yeah, I've I've kept kept my eye on a few announcements here and there, and obviously there's been a lot of stuff related to Minecraft coming out this year because of the 15th anniversary. So the, there's like all kinds of announcements popping up there. Um, but like my gaming hasn't just stuck with video games lately either. Um, the group that I play Dungeons and Dragons with on Twitch, uh, the 8-Bit Community crowd, we've just wrapped up the full arc of our Princes of the Apocalypse campaign. Uh, basically this weekend was our last session in that. So we've reached level 10, we beat the final boss of the final dungeon, and we've all basically been sucked through a portal between planes and we're going to arrive in a completely different dimension to start the next one whenever our DM decides to pick up again. So we've we've had a bit of fun with that and I'm starting to put out feelers to other friends and, and family members even who were interested in playing more tabletop stuff. Um, my brother-in-law Chris, who uh, I went over to the United States and conducted his wedding recently, um, but he's going to be potentially joining our D&D group at some stage because he was interested in in playing a little bit and uh i am getting ready to run my first game of Merkbury, which is uh more accurately pronounced in british english as Morkborg. <laughs> um it's a really death metal inspired kind of apocalyptic dark fantasy tabletop rpg and i will leave a link for anybody who wants to find it in the show notes because the art for this game is absolutely wild and it's kind of more on the level of something like Dark Souls or Elden Ring in terms of its tone. I will note that the back of the book says really not suitable for those under 16 years of age. <laughs> so take that as your your advisory for, for content warning. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, apocalyptic in the grandest sense. The entire world is dying. Skeletons are rising out of graves, setting themselves on fire and then attacking towns, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm going to run a game of this for the 8-bit community in between arcs of our D&D &D campaign. So while our DM is preparing the next set of adventures for our Dungeons & Dragons characters, we're going to be taking a, a side adventure into Merkbury. 
Um, it's it's a Swedish game, hence the uh, the pronunciation, and it's uh, kind of brutal compared to Dungeons and Dragons. It has an emphasis on your characters being fairly frail and vulnerable, and needing to use a lot more of the tools in their surroundings to take on challenges and and beat up enemies because that you have like three hit points and you get hit once you're probably going to die <laughs> so there's a lot of mechanics in the game to help you avoid that but sometimes it is just going to be like right you need to roll another character because your first character has just died in a fairly brutal fashion and even though we've taken a lot of humor from the setting of our D campaign because D invites that kind of fantasy world whimsy a lot of the time I'm going to try and encourage the group to play into the humor of this setting, which I think is way funnier if you take it super seriously. You know, if if somebody asks you how you're doing that day and you're like, my days are numbered, the sky is black and nothing, like doom has come upon us all, and you're like, you know, sandbox preacher shouting on the corner of the street, I think it, it just makes it, like, way funnier to me. <laughs> so I'm I'm hoping that everybody else feels the same way. Sandy in our live chat is saying that it translates to dark castle. Yes, Dark Fort, I think, is the, the, the um, approximation it gives in the, in the rulebook, in the, in the English rulebook. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's wacky. Again, there's, there's, there's so many of those sort of absurdist, almost dark fantasy conventions about it that remind me of stuff like Elden Ring. Like in Elden Ring, there's a boss fight in which, this is fairly early on, so not a huge spoiler, and the game's been out for a little while, but uh, a boss gets halfway through the the battle you've taken his health bar down to about halfway he chops his own arm off and attaches a dragon's head to it and then the dragon's head starts <laughs> spewing fire and the battle continues and that's like his second phase transition right so mokbore is full of stuff like that it's like there are two-headed basilisks that basically run the world and have prophesied the doom of everything uh there are mechanics where every day you play in game like you know every every time the sun rises on your characters you roll dice and if the dice roll a one like a critical miss that would be in dungeons and dragons then uh, another misery befalls the world and you basically have a countdown clock to when the world is going to end and there are effects that happen on the world itself. You sort of read from a passage of it, and it's like a kind of revelations page from the Bible. It's like, you know, and the sea shall blacken and become tar, you know, and then you have <laughs> wow. to deal with the consequences of that for your characters. Like, you can't cross the sea anymore. Like, the, you know, travel by water basically becomes impossible. Does this affect the rivers as well? Do you even have clean drinking water anymore? Like, it, it gets potentially very scary, and... I, I like the idea of, of playing through at least a scenario of this and maybe doing a bit more if the group is into it. Incidentally, that calendar, that kind of countdown clock, ends with the seventh misery befalling the world. Um, and then, you know, the, the seventh time you get one of these miseries come up, it says the world ends, you know, the, the doom of the world is upon us. And it instructs you to burn the book. <laughs> so you, you just burn the rule book at the end of this thing. And I guess have to buy another copy or something. Maybe you print one out and burn it. But it's, <laughs> again, such such a metal way of doing things that I just, I just think is like, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but like really cool at the same time. You know, this is the kind of thing that everybody thought Dungeons and Dragons was when the kind of 80s satanic panic stuff was happening. Right. And and I think it's it's kind of revels in that image and it's it's glorious. I'm really looking forward to it. In looking through some of the art that they have on the website, like everything looks like a metal t-shirt. Everything. Yes. It really does, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Like there's it's all like you know those bands that have the uh the the band name written in this kind of spiky scrawl of like basically indecipherable font mm -hmm. um the, the kind of things that azuma reviews a lot on his music blog it's it's that kind <laughs> of that kind of stuff right where it's like you can barely read what's written there and that there is even a page that says something like you know apocalyptic disasters but it is written out in this oddly printed way where it's hyphenated at weird places and so you kind of have to read it a couple of times before you understand what it says. And then there's a footnote at the bottom in like pink text that says, you read it wrong, you fool. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and it's like, it, it knows what it's doing. And I love that about like, they, they put so much like care and attention into the rule book feeling like it is also part of the scenery. And like, I don't know, something about the, the tone that they've set with it 
it feels like the rule book is playing into that like the text is just like slightly askew on some of the pages so you read it and you feel like you can't read straight for whatever reason and there's just like a couple of subtle things about it like that that it, it just feels like it's warping your mind slightly as you're reading it which definitely gets you in the mood to play the game that's very cool it's been a long time since i've done any tabletop gaming and i um i i only ever familiar really with with dungeons and dragons i think that was the fifth edition that i played i can't really remember who was who mm -hmm. was running the what um but uh i did enjoy it and i i weirdly i haven't gotten into like Baldur's gate or any of the stuff that you see in video games that are very similar to that experience I yeah, just, yeah. I, for whatever reason i tend to gravitate more to like action related games I, I don't know whether it's because my gaming work that i do obviously with you for with you know the spawn chunks and minecraft and then my own stuff with satisfactory it's all very still like there's not a lot of action happening in in what yeah. i do and so when i go to other games i tend to go for more actiony stuff even though very often i'll be like wanting a chill experience and i'll end up like watching youtube or watching a, a podcast because it's a low uh activity kind of a uh, visual experience and really what i should do is look at more of these games that are story based and less like button mashy and require you to be on top of your game because mm -hmm. at, at, at night I'm, I'm tired especially if i've worked out after work like i've gone for a big 90 minute lift session and i come home and have dinner like i'm a vegetable on the couch and i need mm -hmm. you know like i want to i'm not going to bed at 8 30 but like i definitely want to just chill and um having something that would be similar to like a tabletop uh, that i could do solo here would be really really cool yeah, I think Baldur's Gate appeals to a lot of people in that way because mm. it's like, it's D&D, &D, but you don't have to organize it and get all your friends together and make yes. sure that it works for everyone's schedules, right? That's like the main the main draw of it. Whereas I find the thing that would put me off playing something like Baldur's Gate is the thing I absolutely love about playing tabletop RPGs is that it becomes a collaborative storytelling exercise. Right, yeah. And while obviously the games like Baldur's Gate have taken great pains to make sure that your player choice matters and that you're having an effect on the world and that you have have a lot of freedom within the scenario there's still a scenario there that you're playing through it's a lot more like playing a D, D module where your dungeon master has a book and if you deviate too far from the book you're kind of off the rails and they try and steer you back on just for the sake of it being a coherent story but i like to run homebrew stuff and i like the idea of the players having a lot more agency even than a, a modern game these days is able to give you so if anything that's what's maybe steered me away from playing stuff like dragon age or Baldur's gate where it feels like a more linear story i played all my jrpgs back in like the early 2000s and i feel like i'm sort of done with that now give or take elden ring which is more action rpg than like traditional turn-based roll some dice kind of stuff you've done a couple of homebrew campaigns right I've done the main one that is still sort of ongoing is just with my partner and a couple of our friends. Um, but the the stuff I did when we ran Stillfleet, which is a different system, but um, it's a sci-fi thing that was made by uh, some folks I've been following online for a little while. Um, that was a completely homebrewed scenario b built within the sort of Stillfleet universe. Um, so I've done stuff like that before. And I like writing things like this. It's a cool writing exercise. And I used to do a lot more creative writing when I was a little bit younger and before Minecraft YouTube became my main profession and a lot of my creative output went into that. So this is kind of me revisiting that stuff and doing a bit more storytelling for once, which feels like a nice change of pace. I'd imagine there'd be some good crossover tools between what you do creatively in Minecraft. And I mean, Minecraft is a sandbox, tell a story kind of game. And then, yeah. you know, you're able to take those tools and bring them over to something like a tabletop RPG, like Morkborg or D and D, whatever those happen to be. And there's a certain amount of like go with the flow with Minecraft because we very often get inspired by the Minecraft landscape, which is of course procedurally generated. And I feel like you'd have to have the same um, radar for that kind of thing happening around a D and D group or table. You know, to just kind of like, oh, yeah, that's an interesting thing I didn't expect to happen. What if I leaned into that? Like, what if I took that and run with it in between sessions and like create something that you had no idea and had no plan for not five minutes before, but now you've got like this, these other tools available to you, right? I think a lot of the things D&D &D and Minecraft have in common is that emergent gameplay concept, the idea that, you know, you're going to take things in a different direction and use the tools you have to create something that feels 
unique and often unintended by the game's developers. And Dungeons and Dragons itself is just a game engine. Like, it's basically a set of tools that you can use to create your own game, more or less. So I think that's one of the things that I still find kind of fantastic about it. We should get into the Rings of Power Season 2. We are going to give you all a spoiler warning. Uh, Johnny and I have both watched the first three episodes. They launched three episodes with season two. So we will be discussing those, uh, talking about events that happened, and we will be spoiling some things. Uh, There's just too much to talk about, like spoiling blow by blow the plot points because they were long episodes. And I, I do feel, though, that it's worth watching and worth people seeing these things on their own. So if you are are not worried about spoilers, by all means, stick around. But if you are, just come back after you've had a chance to check out the first three episodes. I'll kick us off with some positive review stuff. Uh, Generally, overall, I think the immersion of Middle Earth remains one of the show's strong points. I have never questioned where I am or what mood I'm supposed to be feeling with the set decor the costuming the production is high value like everything is very immersive the visual effects are top notch as well i i'm not noticing anything that feels very we'll say like tv special effects like it's it's very very big budget it's it's thoughtful in the way that they use establishing shots different things like that i also feel like the acting is very good perhaps even improved upon season one There's a couple of grievances here and there, but I'll get into that later. Really, across the board, I'm really feeling like it's it's a good presentation and the pacing is better than season one. Perhaps that's because season one was a little bit of a prologue, like it's a little bit of a of a long setup uh, with a big kind of crescendo in the end of season one. And here in season two, we have all that behind us. The rings exist or at least the three elven rings exist, and we immediately are dealing with rings of power, as in the name of the show, (laughs) and getting to see what those next steps entail. So I think there's a little bit more of an enticing story to follow for viewers compared to season one. And I'm enjoying it so far. What's been your initial review of season two so far? I'm really enjoying it too. I I guess I'm sort of trying to piece together in my head what I think the climactic events are going to be at this point, because with three episodes released, I assume it's going to be an eight episode season. I think they've confirmed it's eight episodes, it is, yeah. just like, like season one was. So I'm sort of wondering where this season leaves us already, which maybe isn't where I should be. I should be like, you know, immersed in the current events that are happening and kind of thinking about it, uh, you know, week to week. But I think... Last season had a lot of setup to do and it had a lot of mystery that it was presenting to the viewer. Um, we, I'm kind of glad we're past some of that. We're past the whole which of these characters is Sauron thing, um, which a lot of people dwelled over in season one. I found it a fun diversion. Some people find it kind of challenging when they're supposed to know everything about this story going in because they've read the books and then it turns out that the show still wants to pull the rug every so often but i think this season because we've established the characters we understand the relationships it doesn't have to do so much of that it can take care of some of it through shorthand it can build on those relationships in really interesting ways and it can start to move the plot forward the plot i think is still gathering speed by the end of episode three like it's not really kicked off in a way that the climax of season one really was the eruption of mount doom which i think happens in episode at the end of episode six beginning of seven or something like that so there's still like an episode or so of fallout from that but um i think that really felt like it picked up a huge pace for the end of the season and now we're back down to talking about where characters are since then there's a little bit more calm before the next storm builds up so so far i'm really enjoying it like you happy to be back in the world happy to be immersed loving what they're doing building up some of these characters and introducing relationships between characters that you might not have expected i'm really looking forward to seeing where they go with it next but right now i don't really have any significant complaints like i think there's a lot of stuff they're doing right i think the only thing that struck me as a little bit funny was being unaware that they had recast Adar. Oh, right. Yeah. See, I'd, I'd heard about that beforehand. I think Benjamin Maul stepped away after last season 
Um, I'm not sure exactly what his reasons were, but um, yeah, I guess they they ended up recasting him quite quickly after season one ended, from what I heard. And they did an okay job of adding a prologue to the first episode of going back in time. I think they told you that you went back in time with like an on-screen point in time but like i'm you have to really know where you are in the tolkien lore to realize oh this is before season one but you like you caught on by the end of it because i think the ice castle that they're in in this in this prologue is where galadriel and her crew are also going in the first season so this happens before she gets there and it is the new uh adar uh, actor uh who does fine um, but it looks very different than than Benjamin Mole. Did you say his name was? Uh, so, sorry, Joseph Mole. I, I just looked it up, and yeah, I, I think I'm confusing him because he played Benjen Stark on Game Correct. of Thrones. Yes. So I'm, I'm getting I'm getting that that name mixed up in my head. But yeah, Joseph Mole is the the previous guy. And so he already has like a a very recognizable face for fantasy fans, right? From Game yeah, of Thrones. Yeah. And and even under all the the makeup for Adar in season one of Rings of Power, he's a very recognizable actor. And so at first I was like, well, who's this guy? I said, like, wait, wait, no, no, that's Adar. And he's got all the scars. Okay. And I said, they must have recast him. And I didn't look it up, yeah. but I just like, okay, well, they recast him. But I thought that was a good way of kind of reestablishing this character by showing this actor back before and show, then showing him again in the current timeline, at, you know, obviously as the same as the same character. The problem that I that really threw me there was that they also so, showed Sauron, but being portrayed temporarily by a different actor. Yeah, yeah. So it's like they've recast the whole show suddenly. Yeah, I was like, did they recast <laughs> yeah. Sauron as well? Like that's wild. And now since season one, I've I've learned a little bit more about Sauron and that he's a shapeshifter. And so I thought, all right, well, okay, maybe. Um, but like that kind of stuff gets really confusing for people that aren't steeped in Tolkien lore. So I was like, what is going on? So I I did find it. I was hard to pay attention to the prologue because I was so confused and I was trying to figure out what the heck was going on rather than listening to what was being said and what was happening. And so, yeah. um, in watching some people review it, uh, in some blow by blow, I had kind of like a, a quasi second viewing and I felt a little bit more at home with it after that. Um, because not only is the, the character of Sauron being played by a different actor, but they're also being presented as an elf for the first time in, in mm -hmm. what we've seen. So, I don't know if it was necessarily a bet, the, a good decision for that, but my guess is that because Sauron is a shapeshifter and because we have specific actors uh, that are playing, you know, him in this world, um, I'm guessing that they wanted Sauron as Halbrad to be unrecognizable to Adar because they do cross yeah. paths in, in the, the current timeline. So it would make sense that Sauron would look different to Adar back then in order to be able to fool Adar as Halbrad, as Halbrad has fooled so many people uh, in in the current timeline in, in season two. So that was, the, I think, the only thing that kind of struck me funny. Um, and that and getting visuals for what Sauron is. And again, like <laughs> yeah, I've, been able, uh -huh. I've been able to go back and kind of like refresh my me memory. And uh, he's a Maiar, which is like an sort of like a, an angel or a secondary uh creation of the valar like a lower a lesser valar uh, that was corrupted yeah. by melkor or morgoth depending on what language you're looking in uh, and in servitude to melkor became a very powerful dark wizard and so he's more of a of a being than like a, an ethereal being than he is really a a flesh and bone sorcerer like we think of Saruman or Gandalf, but you find out that Gandalf is also a Meyer too. And so yeah. I thought it was really interesting how in this show they don't want to just like have Sauron be like a voice in the background or like a puff of smoke. Like you kind of have to be a little bit more visual with it. And so their choices in depicting Sauron, who dies in this prologue in terms of his physical form. But then his blood, which is like black as tar, uh, creeps down into the bottoms of the earth and kind of like pools and eventually is able to snag like a rat and a centipede. And it turns into kind of like a, a very similar visual to the Venom symbiote 
that we've all seen in <laughs> Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah, I've I've seen a few people like compare it to Venom, and they'd be like, "Oh, yeah. they ripped off Venom." I'm like, "He didn't rip off Venom. Like, it's a it's a different story. <laughs> like, yeah. it's it's a similar visual, but yeah, I feel like some people take it a little too far when they compare the two things. It yeah, it is a little yeah, it's a little hard when you've already seen stuff like this, like a black goo that lashes out with tendrils. Like everybody thinks about Venom, right? Like it's kind of hard not to yeah. in pop culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and had those Venom movies not come out, people might make the connection comic book nerds might but like because tom hardy was in it like i think a lot of people now know more about venom yeah and it's not entirely the same it's not necessarily slimy it's almost like a carpet like it's crawling with worms it looks like insects it looks it reminds you almost more of stuff visuals from the mummy if you think about like scarab beetles like taking form and giving a face and eventually yeah. you start to see like what looks like a head what looks like an arm as this like black thing kind of moves around but it's very effective in terms of it's not like stabbing or 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 killing or eating it's more like consuming like there's a lot more um energy transfer that seems to be portrayed in it when it kills the rat it kind of crushes it and that's the first time you see that. And then later on, once it gets out into the world and it's kind of like skulking around and eventually gets onto a wagon where this like peddler lady is just traveling across the, the landscape and it consumes her to eventually be, have enough energy to have human form and be portrayed as Halbrand. Um, you don't see it, but the cart shakes and the sound effects, like the crunching is oh yeah it's oh. grim <laughs> yeah and it's i mean a very effective and i think it's a great example of like it's more effective that you can't see what's going on you saw a little bit with the rat so you kind of know what to expect but like to have that happen to a human is like it just they did a really good job there and it again feels like he kind of consumes these lives in order to gain strength i don't know where or how how brands looks like i guess that's just the thing that it's a human and that's just how he decided to be um there's no there was no correlation between hal brand and that elf that i mentioned earlier that was saying that they were sauron that died so in a way like obviously it's meant to fool adar but also it's hard for the viewer to kind of draw the through line there and so I found myself wanting to look up more about Sauron and refresh my memory after that sequence. Cause like, okay, what, what exactly is he again? Like, remind me why he's able to do this. And is it even a, he like, there's just all these different um, ways that you can think about Sauron, but it's a, uh, it's definitely a higher concept, I think, than the show originally gave us in season one. And I think that they're doing a good job of saying like, no, this is, this is more than just, just like a dude pretending to be somebody it's it's a little bit more complicated than that yeah i've seen a couple of really useful references back to the original lord of the rings text when gandalf is talking about fighting the balrog once he's come back as gandalf the white and he's explaining you know long and hard we fought over the sort of drop into the lake in um under moria and then like climbing up to the highest mountain top and i smote his ruin on the mountainside that whole thing in the book he goes on to describe when the when they fall into the lake the balrog's fire is extinguished but the thing inside of it the kind of shadowy form resembles something more like a slime and it like drags you down with it kind of thing like and i think that might be some of the imagery they drew on for creating this uh, this kind of depiction of Sauron, which is a little weird at first. I find it looks kind of pathetic for a bit because he's like sliding down this kind of snowy mountain mm -hmm. in slime form. And it has the same sort of physics as those video games like Fall Guys or Gang Beasts or Human Fall Flat, where, you know, it doesn't quite know how to hold its own weight. And there's this sort of rubbery, like, wobbling all over the place and falling over it feels a bit too slapstick which is why like i think at first it it's something you laugh at almost and then you feel kind of like it, it looks a bit more pathetic in that sense obviously it's just devoured a rat like you said so it's naturally a little bit more creepy but i think it's an odd tone for the opening of the show but then quickly kind of course corrected by the evil that this blob shape thing is is doing and yeah definitely a, an interesting way to set up the journey that 
Sauron then goes on because he encounters a bunch of um, people fleeing from orc destruction in the Southland, or what, like, you know, the, the, the lands in the east that kind of maybe form part of the Southlands. Um, and he's basically walking back towards the areas that the orcs and stuff are pillaging. And and a guy warns him against it, and he says, you know, that way lies death. And he's like, well, maybe that's still my path. And so he's kind of saying, like, maybe I'm the one bringing the death, you know, like, maybe don't be so hasty to to judge kind of thing. But a lot of his words are very guarded, and a lot of the stuff he says has double meaning. And that's really solid writing for a character like Sauron, who for a start is known as Sauron the Deceiver. And we'll get into, like, mm -hmm. you know, the other people he lies to and how he lies to people. But at this point, he's becoming a con artist, but he's telling a lot of white lies in the process, right? He's saying a lot of stuff where, you know, you could interpret it in a variety of different ways. A lot of the time he's telling the truth. He's not, like, overtly lying to people, but he's leaving room for interpretation in there and he's leaving effectively like you know a second meaning that it could take that is often completely the opposite situation and so i think that that kind of stuff whenever they they have him talking to like keller brimble later on or whenever he's sort of talking to adar later when he's you know turns himself in basically and is captured he swears fealty to the lord of mordor not to Adar, and so right. like you know, kind of implying like oh, I'm s swearing fealty to myself. You just don't know it yet, you know. And so yeah, I I think I think there's really interesting stuff going on with Sauron. They did say at the end of season one that season two now the cat's out of the bag and we know which character Sauron is. We can go a lot more into what decisions led him to the place where he is. So I think the first episode does a good job of kind of catching us up on that stuff, even if some of the the choices like the fact that he's completely overthrown at the beginning by the orcs and everybody seem to not come out of left field because we sort of got the context that there's bad blood between him and Adar, but you you don't necessarily expect him to be taken out by a mob that feel like they should be his own people because they're all on the evil side, right? Like, it, it proves that there's a bit more going on than just the black and white good versus evil that people are used to from Lord of the Rings. That's what I got as well. And if I'm correct in remembering, Adar is the first Uruk, like the first corrupted elf. It's it's vague. He's just kind of one of them, I think. And and I guess the orc race considers him like a father figure. Father figure so yeah. uh, if nothing else, yeah, he's like the oldest of them, or at least like, you know, kind of responsible for their care, or sees himself that way, at least. So yeah, he's um he's not really a, a character that Tolkien necessarily wrote, because Tolkien was very conflicted about the origins of orcs, and whether they were all elves who had been corrupted, or whether they were simply like, you know, homunculi, basically. They were all kind of like uh, soulless puppets of the Dark Lord's will. And then that was why it was okay to just slaughter them en masse. He was kind of conflicted about where their souls end up going after they die. If they had souls to begin with, then, you know, he has to create a cosmology around that in the same way that the elves return to Valinor when their mortal forms are defeated in Middle-earth. And so there's, yeah, there's there's a bit of... The show is playing with both angles of that. Like, they're, they're kind of imagining that orcs are cannon fodder in the way that they are for the Lord of the Rings movies, but also showing you some of the more, um, like, day-to-day -day life of an orc. What is that actually like? You even see, like, an orc couple holding, like, a swaddled, what you assume is an orc baby at one point. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, now that's something we have to reckon with because there are orc children now. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's odd dealing with the realities of that, but the show seems intent to confront that head on which is a really interesting choice and i don't in any way shape or form remember any female orc from the peter jackson films like they were all sure at least yeah. all the speaking roles were all men and in those films at least the urukai like they sort of like are birthed in this gross kind of like pod way so you don't really see how orc populations would increase you're just like you think of them more as insects, especially like the orcs in Moria, like they're scrambling around and climbing the walls and all that kind of stuff. And so I was surprised to see the orc uh, couple with a with a small baby orc as well. That reminds me more of like the orcs from World of Warcraft that are more of a yeah. nomadic people than than some sort of evil kind of twist on things. And I like that you mentioned the cannon fodder thing because 
that's how I see the difference between Adar and, and Sauron is that Sauron sees them as cannon fodder and, and disposable yeah. for means to his ends, right? Whereas Adar is like, no, I, I'm fighting for the survival of my people, my children. Like I want them to have their space in the middle, in middle earth. I think there's a line that Adar uses talking to one of the orcs about like, men will always find you disgusting and gross and twisted and, and try to rid the world of you. So we have to be fortified against that and we have to fight for our right to survive. And there's some interesting language that's used to, I don't want to say humanize the orcs, but certainly establish them as uh, a race in Middle yeah. Earth, as opposed to just a force of evil that must be de destroyed i mean we all still see them that way because like they're just they're murderous and <laughs> represent a lot of you know what the morals that we would consider you know, just terrible so it's also they're also gross like the the what i mean it's all gray and dirty and like there's i've never seen a clean orc ever i don't think visually <laughs> yeah, on screen course. right uh so yeah. it's 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 interesting to see the how they how they show that i like the specific language that sauron uses as well and I feel like he's in the white lies you mentioned, it's almost like he's testing and learning. It's like, so if I say this, will this human catch on or will this yeah. human fall to their own preconceived notions and stay on the path that they've already decided for themselves rather than open their eyes to my very apparent deception. And it's like, Oh yeah. no, they're as dumb as they look. Okay. You know, okay, and on we go. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's a really good way of, of illustrating like that warm up to, bigger lies and, and bigger deceptions the other thing that I, I really liked about the initial feelings of of the the premiere was the feeling of being home when they go back to see uh the stranger and nori walking through the wastes of this adventure land that they're going on uh, i think at the time it's later on it's revealed that it's ruined but um where they are is twisty and they're on their own and they're just walking and talking but i really enjoy daniel wayman as the stranger now that he's talking more and mm -hmm. while there's no big reveal there yet it, it it does feel familiar in how he delivers lines the thoughtful way that he talks about things a little bit of the mysterious kind of like very gandalfy very ben kenobi answering questions and riddles when nori asks about certain things and there's just something about the combination, I think, of music, visuals, the juxtaposition of a halfling, you know, Harfoot with a very wizardy looking person, even though he's very brown and, and doesn't have a staff yet. That just feels like home. It reminds you of the first sequences in Fellowship of the Ring between Frodo and Gandalf and Bilbo yeah. and Gandalf. And, and I, I, I like that feeling. I like that they were able to establish nori and then eventually uh poppy happy to see poppy back as well in this world as that kind of home feeling and they even use the word home i think a lot in the first episode like how's home when home doesn't have a location home is just like the the wandering tribe of harfoots right yeah and i i think they do a really good job of pinging that nostalgia for viewers but also that warm feeling of home which makes you feel very protective of nori and poppy and the stranger as events unfold throughout the, the first few episodes. So I like that they, they did that as well. And I did notice though, that the stowaway or the, the fact that they were being followed, the misdirection of being followed by one of these metal masked men, then to lay a trap and try to capture this thing only to hear the female squeal when the, the trap is sprung. You're like that, that sounds like someone we are not expecting <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and turns out to be poppy. And I'm glad that she's back because I find the Nori Poppy dynamic very, very fun and really, really sweet. Uh, but it reminds me immediately of Sam eavesdropping on Frodo and Gandalf talking only to be then <laughs> yes, sidekicked yeah. and strung along for this journey. Again, Poppy was told not to come, uh, was left behind and basically followed them uh, this entire, whatever the timeline is between last season and this season to then finally be revealed and say like, well, I've been following you. I might as well join you now sort of deal. And 
even says something like, well, you haven't really gotten that far. <laughs> That's one of the things I love about Poppy. They ended her last, her arc last season with her basically becoming the Wayfinder, like taking the place of Lenny Henry's character. Mm -hmm. And and she's the one who can like read the star charts and everything and, and help everybody migrate. And it seems like actually the Harfoots are good doing that on their own. They've been running the same kind of like circuit for a while, so they're probably fine. And when she comes to the group, while Sam is obviously, you know, very stout and brave and he's there to carry the stuff and cook for them and he's kind of Frodo's, like, manservant, basically, for most of Lord of the Rings. It's obviously by the end of it that he's kind of coming to his own and they're a bit more like equals. Um, but he starts off, he's the gardener, you know? Um, whereas Poppy feels like she brings a, an established skill set to them already because she immediately sets them on the right path. There's that scene where they recontextualize the walking song from season one and it's actually a bit more of like a history of how the Harfoots might have migrated from the eastern lands of Rune into more of the Rovanian area of Middle-earth where they we find them in season one and that's really fascinating because a lot of Tolkien's like origins for the elves and humans and other races a lot of them come from the east and then sort of migrate further west the elves do that because they're invited to go to Valinor by the Valar but a lot of humans and stuff do that as well because they're seeking more fertile lands and places that, you know, culture has already been established and they're coming out of areas that are less hospitable terrain. I think it's really interesting to learn that not only do the Harfoots come from there, but their walking song is effectively telling the history of that migration. And it's a really fun kind of cultural thing of like, you know, it's it's like how kids sing like ring around the rosy or whatever and it turns out that if you dig into the lyrics of that it's originally about the bubonic plague and nobody remembers that aspect anymore when they're learning it on the playground and you find that out later in life and that's the kind of shocking aspect of it but i think this is similar to that where they find out or the the audience at least finds out that uh the walking song they use is actually more like an oral history of how the harfoots came where they are yeah, I like the parallels to things like fairy tales originally being like moral stories of like, don't go into the woods alone because you'll probably sure, yeah, deal yeah. with exposure, like, death and danger. So we're going to make yeah. up stories about witches and werewolves and crazy things that will keep you scared and here in camp where we can keep an eye on you. <laughs> like that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 I thought it was really good too. And I, I, we didn't get to hear it, but we heard like a, a the, the background music kind of played the theme a little bit because I remember kind of mm -hmm. like singing along in my head. Um, but it's it's such a a great moment from season one. I'm glad that they kind of brought that back, and I thought it was cool too. Really, a really neat you know moment for the the Harfoots and for I think for the viewer to like realize how essential Poppy is and how they're going to get out of uh, Norian and the stranger are going in circles. And yeah. I think that it really does help them kind of break that cycle. The relationship between Galadriel and Gilgalad, and I, I know from season one that Galadriel knows that Helbrand is Sauron, and yeah. she's warned Elrond. Elrond knows it as well. I don't know if she warned him on purpose because I think she wanted the rings to be created, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, so he goes down to the river where they have their confrontation, where Galadriel and Sauron face off and you mm -hmm. get the reveal. And the scroll that I think was supposed to be the lineage of the Southlands kings has been like thrown into the river, presumably when he sort of stuns her and then leaves. Mm -hmm. um, and so Elrond finds that. And then by the time he gets back to the forge they they're already making the rings and so i don't think it's ever explicitly a conversation between galadriel and elrond that he is sauron elrond just knows that what galadriel discovered was the lineage of the southlands was broken and halbrand can't be the king but she doesn't necessarily reveal to anyone else that he is sauron until she talks to gilgalad and elrond in the first episode and so this is where i'm I'm often confused about the motivations of the elves because I mean, the, the three rings of power and the mission of Sauron or the steps that he's taken are overlooked or ignored by the elves, usually because of their own hubris. And yeah, it tends to really prey on that and later their ego with Calibrimbor specifically. But 
Yeah. I found it so strange that Galadriel was so quick to want to use the rings to eventually in, I think episode one or two pick up and put on one of the rings end of episode one the three rings are on the fingers of the three elves who are yes. going to have them for a while yeah sir dan i know is the first one to put on a ring and i know like i felt like that was a little bit strange in terms of how it happened and which kind of like starts the landslide of this eventual triple ring threat with the elves is that he's in a boat with the mission from Elrond to he's going to drop the rings into the ocean into what is essentially the deepest trench that he knows of as someone yeah. that's a the top elf mariner and he doesn't do it because the boat gets rocked and he eventually he just kind of like peers into like this tiny opening in the bag and eventually pulls out a ring and puts it on like just comes to the temptation of of the rings and I just thought it was so strange that the entire history of Middle Earth is shifted by like a boat rocking <laughs> and yeah yeah I kind of wanted them to show like the sea creature from the prologue just, just a little bit. Cause that's the first thing I thought of was like, was that an accidental boat rocking? Like, where did that come from? That seemed yeah. like a strange rogue wave. And I, 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 you kind of thought that if Sauron had a hand in these rings to make them twisted in some way, that they would also then attract the, the darkness that is out there in the deep. And that maybe this thing kind of swam by just at the right time. But I, you don't, you don't really ever see any kind of visual confirmation of that. But then that's Serdan that does that uh, and then goes back and expresses to the king, this is the most power I've ever felt. We can absolutely save their realm on Middle Earth, which is coming to an end, or their time on Middle Earth, which is coming to an end. And I, I do find it strange that Gilgalad and Gladriel so quickly put on the rings Gladriel has a little bit more of a moral compass, I feel like, than Gilgalad. But Gilgalad like doesn't seem to have any love for Middle Earth or humans. I don't know why the elves have not just said "screw y'all" and just we're leaving. Uh, we cannot use these rings to save this place because Sauron, who, which he knows, has had a hand in creating them, and you're all on your own. Tough luck, goodbye. And I don't know why that's why they decide to stay. It's the hard thing that I'm trying to wrap my head around. It's tricky because effectively, yeah, they go if they go home to Valinor, that's more or less paradise. But they would do that in the knowledge that they were abandoning Middle Earth to darkness. And the elves see themselves as one of the only races that can really stand against a threat like Sauron. Especially at the stage in their civilization they're at. They're not quite at the height of their power, but you know, Linden is prosperous, the elves are forging all of these, you know, magnificent things, they're well trained soldiers, they've been keeping track on, you know, the area that's now the Southlands for a while. That's all happening in season one, and you know, the High King is recalling them from some areas because he thinks, okay, the war is basically over, doesn't look like Morgoth is coming back. We think Sauron is gone we're gonna, you know, drink and be happy for a while. And what they discover in season one is that the elvish presence in Middle-earth is not sustainable. They're going to fade and become a ghost of their former self, right? When Galadriel in The Lord of the Rings talks about diminishing and going into the West, mm. the diminishing part is happening to basically all elves everywhere. Like, they simply will wither away until they become spectres, more or less, if they stay in Middle-earth. And if you think about it, that has a lot of ties into, like, folk tales that, you know, a lot of which are established in, like, British folk tradition of, like, you know, fairies and there being sort of this sense of a, a presence watching you in the forest and being, you know, whispered away by, by like, elves or whatever and, and kind of taking a trip to fairyland if you walk through a certain part of a forest or something and the elves being this sort of ethereal presence because what Tolkien like wants to establish is this uh, sort of mythological canon for the British countryside, basically. And so we're in, imagine that we're in like the fourth age or the fifth age of the world now. The elf presence in the land is all but gone and all that remains is this sort of like whisper of what their former power was. And so they're trying to prevent that from happening with the establishing of these powerful rings, because they discover in season one that Mithril as a substance has this power that can potentially bring life back to the leaves of their tree that they see as the symbol of their lifespan and their presence in Middle-earth being kind of upheld and healthy. 
And so when they all put the rings on and the tree like flowers again and like the leaves all come back and everything is kind of bright and gold, they see that as effectively forestalling this kind of decaying process that's happening to all of the elves. And I guess the rings tempt them to do that. Sauron hasn't necessarily done what he does later on with the dwarf rings. You see him like holding a piece of mithril and he like closes his eyes and is very much like, okay, he's clearly like casting some sort of spell or doing what he does with the one ring and like imbuing it with his malice and lust for power or whatever, right? But he isn't there for the making of the three elven rings, so technically they aren't necessarily imbued with the same trap. The problem is when Sauron forges the one ring later, he still uses that to gain power over the three. Like, just having the one ring is enough for him to reach out to anybody else who has a ring of power and attempt to impose his will over them. So, both Elrond and Galadriel are right, in that, like, Galadriel says, yeah, we should use these rings because they are what can forestall this fading of elves that's happening in Middle-earth right now. But Elrond is right to be suspicious because Sauron does have the ulterior motive, the grand plan of forging the One Ring and bringing every other Ring of Power under his dominion. Right. I do like that dynamic between Galadriel and Gilgalad where he is, I mean, obviously upset with her at the beginning. They're not seeing eye to eye. Uh, but then eventually once Gilgalad puts on a ring, they not necessarily make up but they have a common thread where they're now both seeing visions of the future oh do you notice as well when he puts on the ring originally when he puts on his ring of power he's wearing a ton of other jewelry Mm -hmm. the next time you see his hands he's just wearing the ring of power he's like all of these other rings forget about them they're nothing just this ring now and there's again there's another sign in that of a bit of like a possessiveness to it i think mm-hmm. he even like when he's talking to her his ring is like out his hands are kind of folded one on top of the other and then he like puts the other hand over the top of the ring as if to be like shielding it from something and you do get the sense that there is this possessiveness that happens over the rings even though they are effectively benign and they should be a power for good there's still like a little bit of my precious about it that i think is really interesting yeah, I definitely caught the the jewelry switch for sure. Because when he first put it on, it's like, wow, he's wearing a lot of rings. And when he put the yeah, put it yeah. on, the like costume design, like that's a lot of stuff for an actor to like have on their hands while while they're doing yeah. things. I like the not camaraderie, but the shared experience of Galadriel sensing the seduction and betrayal of Celebrimbor, like knowing that Sauron is out there and that there is, you know, Celebrimbor is is out there doing stuff in i can't remember the name of the elven city it starts with an e um, Eregion. Eregion, yeah and we know what's happening because of course we've we've seen hellbrand show up uh still per- again to Celebrimbor, it's still hellbrand because he like they haven't revealed anything yet uh, but then gilgalad is also talking about the fall of mountains drought clouds over distant lands i'm assuming the kingdom of men there yeah and it, it you're seeing the foreshadowing you know, from the rings. And this is not something I learned from the show, but something I learned from like extended material that I've been researching in that, uh, Gil, uh, Celebrimbor also gave the rings, the three elven rings, the ability to be worn, but not be seen as there. And Mm -hmm. only the possessor of the one ring can see the rings. And one of the reasons in, the Lord of the Rings, why Sauron wants to be reunited with the Ring of Power so much is that at present, he can't see the three rings of the elves until he has the one ring back. And there's Mm -hmm. there's the exchange in the extended edition between Frodo and Galadriel, and it's really subtle. But once this was pointed out to me, I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Where Frodo sees that she's got the ring. And she says, yes, I have one too. When no one else bothered to notice in the other, like, you know, Gimli and those other folks don't see it because of course, Frodo has the the ring. I think it's around his neck at that point. Yeah. And so I thought that was really interesting that, you know, you're talking about uh, Gil-Galad hiding the ring, like putting his hand over it. 
you know, that, that idea of like, I have this, but I don't want other people to know that I have this. Am I ashamed of it? Am I, you know, uh, that possession vibe? Like there's a lot of stuff that the ring kind of exert in terms of the desires and the wills of the people that, that hold them. And through their efforts to do one thing, they ultimately pulled them in a, in a different direction. I'm not so clear on like the powers of Galadriel's ring, but uh, I did find out that there it's it's um it's hers is wind or air, and Gilgalad's is water. <laughs> it makes it sound like Captain Planet, right? It's like this, they're assembling the Planeteers, and I I think each of them is associated with an element, but it's not strictly speaking that they can like conjure fire no, if they no, have no. the Ring of Fire, right? Like. Um, I think Círdan's ring is the Ring of Fire. That one ends up in Gandalf's possession by the yes. time of Lord of the Rings. And that's that's going to be a really interesting thing to see if they do in this show, especially if the stranger turns out to be Gandalf, because Gandalf's supposed to arrive in Middle-earth in the Third Age, and then Círdan gives him his ring because he sees it as having the power to enkindle courage in the hearts of people who are still opposing Sauron. And so that's the the ring of fire is really just like it's more like warmth than fire, right? Um, so it, it's kind of different. But that you see the power of Galadriel's ring really in the fact that Lothlorien is this preserved elven, not like paradise, but at least uh, an elven conclave where it, it seems when the the company enters in Lord of the Rings, when they spend time in Lothlorien, it's like time doesn't really pass, and that is again this factor of like trying to preserve the elves existence in middle earth through the use of the rings galadriel is still doing that as late as the end of the third age and so that's really where the power of the rings lies it's not necessarily like an elemental power but it is a lot more about like yeah preserving their lifespan and making sure that things do not progress which is a weird vibe for elves but that's sort of their whole thing considering mm. they don't have like a natural human like lifespan it's very much about like making sure that the elves can maintain a foothold in middle earth i get like the custodian vibe from elves in terms of the world and the people and like they just they're there to preserve and protect and yeah i've also heard that preservation uh used a lot with the one ring in terms of that it preserves life you know bilbo and gullum both had prolonged lives because of their yes, brief yes. encounter with the ring right and it's it's this weird mix of while we're prolonging your life, uh, a good example is of Gollum. It's not like you stay your youthful self the longer <laughs> yeah, you're around, right? It's not quality of life. It's no, just persistence. Just persistence yeah. and, and length. You know, like it is, it's an interesting, you know, do you want to live forever? Well, maybe not. <laughs> you might want to think about that too. Uh, and I think that became really apparent with the Nine Rings of Men later on too. But that, again, like that's not yeah. in the actual show. This is like my extra research that I did to kind of wrap my head around everything. In terms of like the visual communication in the show uh, the acting and the change in demeanor around the characters that have rings i think is really good i think it's it's subtle but it they become very focused on yeah the rings and what it means and how they're going to approach things and galadriel is still headstrong like she still wants to go and warm uh Celebrimbor and uh there's a bunch of shuffling back and forth and Elrond, the falling out between Elrond and Galadriel is is real, and like you're definitely trying to figure out like how they're going to move forward, and and you can see the divide amongst the elves, and already the rings are kind of like serving their purpose and like creating some friction among the leaders and and I guess prominent figures in Elvendom, and when you flip and look at the other things that are happening, it's it's really subtle and. I really enjoyed the way that they showed the plight of the dwarves where they gave us this really cool visual setup shot with um, Moria and the way that the, the sun shafts were bringing in sunlight and how they could cultivate farms and stuff underground. And yeah. then, and then with the map, they showed like the reach of Mordor and the creation of Mount Doom and the spreading of Mordor has reached as far uh, as Moria and so there's like a tremor and that tremor collapses the sun shafts and so what I get from all of that is it's less of an affront like it's right now you're not seeing the actual physical assault of Mordor on the rest of Middle-earth in terms of the orc armies and all of that 
it's more like the subtle besiegement of resources, the stranglehold, the things that Gil Gallat was talking about, um, fall of mountains, drought, clouds, you know, blocking out the sun and like metaphorically, but then also literally as the sun shafts are keeping the dwarves from making food and they're talking about getting into their grain stores that only last three months. And there's all these things that seem to affect the dwarves. And it's not that it's an immediate threat. It's this long, slow decay of their way of life that's going to force them into making decisions. And eventually you do see at the end of episode two, uh, King Durin the Third bringing Mithril to Celebrimbor. And I, I thought that it, they, they did a good job of the setup, the stress that his kingdom is under when he's presented with this choice, you, you get why he would say, yeah, let's save, let's save the dwarf kingdoms because like our way of life is threatened by this new development. We need to fight back against it. And dwarves are very abrasive and defensive in that way anyway. And I thought that that subtle setup of the shifting of the world, as far as they see, uh, forcing them into this decision is, is a really good way of, of making that decision feel um, reasonable. Whereas if they yeah. knew it was Sauron messing with them, they would be less inclined, you know, to, to go yeah. like, sure, yeah. this bad guy is poking us. Let's do the thing that he said not to do. Like it's, it's a lot more environmental and it's a lot more subtle than like, there's an army of orcs at our door. It hits closer to home and it affects not just people on the battleground, but it affects women and children and the way of life and all that kind of stuff. So it really kind of, feeds the desire of of the dwarves and also sets them up to be distrustful of sauron in future because when the council of elrond is called in the third age and the dwarf representatives come to the council it doesn't happen in the movie in the book they talk about an emissary of sauron showing up and saying like hey sauron is establishing himself back in mordor he'll leave you guys alone but do you have any rings lying around you know and he's like basically pressing them for information about the one ring and they turn away this messenger and you know are basically told you know you have x amount of time to comply or the armies of sauron will be at your doorstep but the dwarves are very distrustful of sauron at that stage and you presume it's because you know everything that happens with the the double cross of them getting rings of power and then Sauron trying to exert his will over them is embedded in dwarf history at that point. I'm really curious actually to see how much else we're going to see of the other dwarf families because the dwarves get seven rings. There are originally seven dwarf households and Durin's folk, the people of Khazad-dûm are really just one of those. But Tolkien never really writes a whole lot about the others. They appear in, like, the Silmarillion here and there, but it's not like there are seven dwarf strongholds that are like khazad -dum. That really feels like the main thing that's part of the story. So I'm not certain how they're going to distribute seven rings among the dwarves that we know of. Um, Durin the Third is supposed to be given the one that gets, like, passed down through the characters that we know until um, I think it's like Thorin's great-grandfather or something gets it, and he's the one who um, ultimately loses it in Moria somewhere at the end. And yeah, like by the time Lord of the Rings comes around, the seven dwarf rings are lost, and the nine rings of men are the ones that have turned them all into ring wraiths. So we know where some of these rings end up, but it's where they begin that's the fascinating part. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how that works for the dwarves. But I think the whole Khazadum storyline is so compelling. Um, perhaps because we already know what it looks like. You know, it ends in tragedy. Mm. And so it's like, you know, you're, we're watching Hamlet. You know, you know everybody's going to die at the end. You just need to see it happen. And Khazadum is such a vibrant and interesting community. Um, the stone singing stuff makes an appearance here, although it doesn't work for them. Like they try and, uh, you know, convince the mountain to not, drop rocks on them and it backfires um and but that's that's still such a cool element of dwarf culture the idea that they have this like symbiotic relationship with the mountain that they talk to it and it talks to them is such a spiritual and cool way of presenting dwarf culture and i think that's that's really fun 
Um, I also noticed here and there that the costume team seems to have responded to some fan criticism from season one, and they've given some more of the female dwarves more prominent facial hair. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because obviously Gimli has that kind of throwaway jokey line about like, you know, you you can't tell a dwarf man from a dwarf woman or like, you know, it's it's, nobody can tell them apart. And then Aragorn is like, it's the beards. But um, yeah, like people genuinely have had long debate over whether dwarf women should have beards or not and there's a few people with like some cheeky sideburns in the background you know like it's it's kind of cool i think they've expanded what we see of Kazadum. there's like markets and obviously yeah the the places where they're growing crops and stuff you get glimpses of in season one but spending more time there before it becomes moria uh, i think is a really a really exciting opportunity for the for the team making the show there's less of a reference to it as a mine and more to uh, as a kingdom, you know, as a, as a people. And the only yeah. other realm that I've heard or seen mentioned before is uh, Erebor, which is, of course, the kingdom under the, under the mountain. But I don't know of the other five. You see people from the other five in, I think, the second Hobbit movie when they show up to help fight. But like, you don't know where you, yeah. don't, ever, you don't ever see where they're from. Like, you don't see the location where they came from. You, they just show up on goats <laughs> i think the kings of erebor are even descended from durin's folk as well like wow, thorin okay. having claimed to be the king under the mountain he's from the line of durin okay so like yeah the the, the dwarf presence there is um like fairly established to be from Kazadum originally mm. but yeah I, i'm not sure at what point erebor is established if it's already like in progress at this point or, or what but the dwarves if they're driven out of Kazadum, they have to find somewhere else to live and they're sort of doomed in the sense that they k- go everywhere looking for riches and mountains to live in, and then a dragon moves into Erebor. <laughs> so, like, they've, they've got a lot of, like, ill-fated homes, basically, um, as far as the dwarves go, which is interesting in terms of the overall mythology of how the dwarves were created and how they weren't part of the original design of the world. It was just supposed to be elves and men, and then one of the Valar decides to create dwarves as well so it, it, it may be something is the, the the dwarves are just kind of cursed in that that strange way um but yeah like i i really like the actors who are all part of the dwarven stuff i think oh i agree a really interesting addition uh in terms of the casting like i was really excited that kirdan was in this but also navi uh who's advisor to the king in the scenes that we see him uh he's played by kevin eldon who's an actor who pops up in a ton of stuff he's in i think hot fuzz um is the movie i've probably seen him in most but he like pops up in all sorts of like british comedy stuff he's a really like well-known character actor like league of gentlemen and and some of those older shows but um he navi the character is the one whose name appears on the doors of moria um so the doors of moria having the kind of you know speak friend and enter you know here is the the kingdom of moria the dwarves and then underneath it, it says, uh, Celebrimbor designed, uh, Navi designed these doors and Celebrimbor painted them, or something like that. And so obviously you see Celebrimbor working on the material that only shows the paint in moonlight. Like, he shows a sample of that to his assistant, but then Navi is this other character who's involved in the creation of those. So somewhere along the line, those two characters have to meet and become friends. And I think that's an exciting thing to to look forward to in terms of the development of the show, because otherwise it's just going to be Celebrimbor being, you know, manipulated by Sauron for the entire season. I think it's going to be interesting to see how that relationship develops and like when the doors get made, because it's going to have to happen while Celebrimbor is still around. How did you feel about Sauron revealing himself or posing as Anatar, the bringer of gifts, and, and oh fooling my Celebrimbor. Drama. Like, him appearing <laughs> surrounded by clouds in this very, like, Renaissance painting-looking way. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's it's artfully constructed, and I had to remember at that moment, because obviously it gets very theatrical, and part of me is wondering, like, how is Celebrimbor really buying any of this? 100%. But obviously... Like, he's let Sauron in, and I think that's the other fascinating thing of that whole relationship developing, is, like, Sauron is like a vampire. Like, he has to be invited into the home in order for them to really, like, for him to start working on Celebrimbor's mind. And I think it's so insidious, but he's, like, standing out there for days, and it's, like, raining the next time he sees him and everything. And then Celebrimbor has, like, invited him in and is, like, serving him food, and, like, it's, it's insidious. But then, obviously, when Sauron says, I am not 
I'm not actually called Halbrand. Like I and and you you have that moment of like, you know, is he gonna just say I'm actually Sauron? But then Celebrimbor is just too far gone at that point. But no, of course, he introduces himself as Anatar and claims to be a servant of the Valar. Although again. He says it in such vague terms that he's leaving himself wiggle room. <laughs> like, he's literally, he's not, like, name-dropping Manway or whoever. Like, he's not like, yeah, Zeus actually sent me. He's, um, you know, being a lot more subtle and a lot more insidious about it. But the angelic way he's painting himself, it, I had to recall when at the end of season one he shows galadriel all of those visions and he's showing her like her brother in valinor and them on the raft and the you know the perspective rotating to show their reflections in the water and realizing oh yeah like once he has a grip in somebody's mind he can kind of create this illusory reality for them so he doesn't actually have to be stepping out of the forge that way with clouds all around him it's all smoke and mirrors and i think it's a really neat way of introducing what the fandom knows as Sauron's presence in Eregion, which is this Anatar character that he develops in order to pose as a messenger of the Valar and manipulate Celebrimbor. I think it was really well done. Like, that whole sequence, I feel like, makes a lot of sense. I even expected it to be happening already in season one, and that's why Celebrimbor is sort of acting kind of odd, but he just seems like an eccentric guy. And then it really sets him up as being a uh, a very easy target for this sort of manipulation. He has these, not even delusions of grandeur, because they are, like, he is capable of great things, but he has that chip on his shoulder about, am I going to live up to all of the elvish craftsmen of the past? Like, am I going to be able to create something that has a place in history? And Sauron definitely starts to prey upon that as soon as he gets a chance to talk to Celebrimbor. Like, it's it's a really, I think, well-written, like, manipulation that ultimately ends up in the, the position the characters need to be for the rings to be crafted. I had to remind myself of a line that they used in a sequence with Galadriel where they said, the, I think it was Gil-Galad saying, like, we cannot send you alone to confront or to stop Sauron because it is said that once the Deceiver has fooled you once, they will always be able to fool you again. Yeah. And I had mm -hmm. to remind myself of that with Celebrimbor. I know in season one, and I really wish I had watched season one again before starting season two, because I know that Halbrad had, you know, fooled Celebrimbor before, or at least befriended him. But like, my criticism, and I do remember this, of that sequence in season one was that it was very mustache twirling, like, oh my God, this is <laughs> creepy and weird, and how is no one noticing this? And I felt that it was very similar in that it's not that it was mustache twirling, but it was just, it's just, it's, it's such a big production of, of Anatar revealing himself and fooling um, Celebrimbor, who you perceive to be like, kind of like the scientist, you know, in Elvendom. Yeah. And and like, yeah. the guy is really smart. Like, how is he so smart and not catching on? But they have to remind yourself, like, right, but but it's magic. Like, he's it's not all reason. It's once he's been fooled, he's just so easily fooled again. And as you said, Sauron does really prey on two things. Celebrimbor's ego, but also the idea of his life's work being threatened by Gilgalad shutting the whole thing down. Yeah. And he's like, well, I'll just tell Gilgalad that I shut the whole thing down. We don't have to actually do it. Right. And just and it starts to feel very not high schooly, but just sort of uh deceptive and and selfish and and again, there's a lot of inward focus on on the characters that are manipulated by Sauron, like if you turn people inwards until themselves, they will be the device of their own destruction. And yeah, if you stop hearing friends, reasoning with friends, reaching out for help, if you just kind of rely on yourself, you're ultimately going to fail, which I think is one of the, the main themes in Tolkien's work. And yeah, it's, it's really cool to see that. And in a way, like you can almost see, there's a really good scene where uh, Celebrimbor is saying, oh, I'll just write to Gilgalad and let him know that we're we're going to shut down the forge. And Anatar at that time kind of like walks around him almost in disbelief, like you would lie to your king. And, yeah, yeah. and it feels kind of like, oh, this is a new development. I didn't realize you would do this so quickly or... I can use this. Like you can see the wheels turning as if like, this isn't necessarily part of Anatar's plan. This is just like, Oh, 
this is an interesting development that I can probably use to my advantage. And you can kind of see those wheels turning. I do find the impatience of Sauron and Atar to be a little bit revealing. And I'm surprised that seems to be more of a something for the audience's benefit, as opposed to the, you know, real conversation between Celebrimbor and, and Anatar. He's very quick to want rings for dwarves and humans. And, and he's um, very impatient later on in, I think the third episode when they're trying to reason with Prince Durin. Yeah. And, and you can feel the impatience from Sauron. He's like, but he's kind of, kind of immortal and and he's playing the long game why is he being so impatient right now because it does nothing but reveal yourself to durin who catches on like this guy doesn't know elrond from a hole in the ground you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very very obvious and I, I liked that about durin's response because that is how the audience is feeling because of course it's a prequel and we all know what happens so you're just like your skin is crawling the whole time that anatar is talking and it's so rewarding as a viewer to have a character in the show like Durin catch on and go "Mm -mm, nope don't trust this guy eventually Durin's father makes the call and he has to swallow his pride and go back to his dad about about the rings and obviously King Durin makes the, the decision to to have the rings made but yeah I'm I'm really curious to know now not just that we've got the three rings of power for the elves but we're also like in only episode three we've got the seven rings being made for the dwarf kings. Right. And so yeah. I'm, I'm really curious to see how, how that's going to pan out. I did feel like a, it was a bit of a, a parlor trick with all the visuals. There was a lot of Christian allegory and stuff that I was like, oh, they could have, yeah. they could have done a little bit more. They could have done, gone a little bit more unique with that. I wasn't so sure that I was on board with that, but I, I feel like the, the thing that's, I think going to be important is that once Galadriel, and we know this from the trailers, if you've seen the trailers, once Galadriel gets to Aaron, is it Arendil? No. What's the name of the town? Uh, Eregion. Eregion. Jeez. I always get them mixed up. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of very similar words. So mm-hmm. I sympathize. <laughs> yeah. So Eregion, once she gets there, I mean, like it is not a stone's throw to look at Air, uh, Anatar and go like, you look like Halbrand with pointy ears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no way. So she's going to recognize him right away. Uh, well, plus they already know that he's supposed to be on his way there or, or that Halbrand is Sauron. And would know that Sauron the Deceiver would be able to take different forms. Like there's a certain amount of information that Elrond, Gilgalad, and Galadriel all possess that Celebrimbor does not. Um, so I'm curious to see how that's going to all pan out. And we'll probably end up with more more action. There's not been a lot of of action happening. There's been a little bit, but nothing uh, too crazy. There's been some adventure stuff with spiders and horses and El Sildor and some action with elves and men's loyal to, to um, Adar and stuff like that. But it, those aren't as gripping, I don't think as the overall tension. I'm really curious to see how the tension between Elrond and Galadriel gets resolved or moves forward. Yeah. And I'm really curious to see what happens with Celebrimbor and, and, and Sauron. Um, And like you said, I'm also invested in the dwarves. So like, I think they've done a really good job of kind of giving you enough of the big bits of the story for season two in the first three episodes there's lots of unanswered questions like we don't know what happened to poppy and nori in the hurricane that the stranger made to quote unquote save them and blew them away <laughs> last seen vanishing in a sandstorm yeah so that's that's that is presumably going to land them somewhere that will still be helpful to their journey but it's going to be interesting to see how that how that works out and how in the rest of rune the uh, the other wizard who seems to be working there is related to any of the the story. Um, th- th- this is an interesting thing for anybody who knows how Tolkien establishes the other wizards, because there are these two blue wizards who are never really mentioned much in The Lord of the Rings at all. Gandalf just mentions that there are five wizards, um, and so Radagast, Saruman, and Gandalf are the ones we know. The two we don't are the two blue wizards. And... It is entirely possible that the stranger could be playing the role of one of them, even if he does turn out to be Gandalf, because the only stuff Tolkien ever wrote about these blue wizards was that they went east, and there are two versions of it. Either they went there to try and convince the people of Rune not to align themselves with Sauron, and that's one of the reasons why there weren't more reinforcements and the War of the Ring was ultimately won by the side of good. The other 
version Tolkien wrote is that they go there, try to establish their own seat of power there, and end up becoming basically cult leaders. And so it seems like the show is trying to do both, if anything. Like, the wizard who is already there is set up as a cult leader, has acolytes, all of this insect imagery that's really kind of interesting to me. And then maybe the stranger is the other blue wizard who is coming there to stop him. The other alternative I've heard pitched by some of the folks I've been watching has been that if the dark sorcerer in Rune turns out to be the Witch King, and, and like somebody who has the background of magic to be you know powerful enough that Sauron might end up giving him one of the rings that is destined for the kings of men, then potentially that sets up a really compelling confrontation between this version of the dark kind of blue wizard and the stranger, that becoming the rivalry between the Witch King and Gandalf. And I think that's like a really cool parallel that the show could be drawing. So I think whichever way that continues to go, it's going to be an exciting direction. We haven't seen a whole lot of Numenor yet. Um, we know that Miriel is supposed to have a coronation. There's a confrontation there. I think the actor who does Miriel is fantastic. I think she's really well written as well. She continues to be a really compelling character to me. She's tragic. She's blind, but has this sort of graceful approach to diffusing situations. Like mm -hmm. a woman slaps her and is like, you know, my child was left in Middle Earth or whatever. And she just handles that whole situation with grace. Nobody is like, you know, clap her in irons. She slapped the queen around the face. It's a lot more like no, I get it. Like, let's talk about it. Let's not sweep this under the rug. Let's, like, share in our grief. And despite this, despite this compassionate queen, you're still seeing Farazon set himself up to be, you know, a usurper, ultimately. Like, he has a crowd of yes-men around him, so as soon as an eagle lands on the doorstep, they're like, look, see, Farazon did that. And so, yeah, I, I get the sense that Numenor is doomed already. Uh, we've already seen its eventual destruction, but you know, I don't know if we're going to see the fall of Numenor in, like, as early as Season 3. Maybe? Like, Gondor has to start somewhere, so I assume it's going to it's gonna be after the fall of Numenor that we start to see that stuff. And then Isildur is still hanging out with Arondir and Theo at the end of Episode 3, and we, we get a little bit of action with them, but not much. So I think there's still a lot that the rest of this season is going to have to go through. It still suffers from there being so many concurrent storylines that they can't really dwell on one storyline for a, a super extended length of time. But by this part in season one, by the end of episode three of season one, they'd still only just introduced Numenor. So there's a long way to go yet, and I think there's going to be some really cool action in the rest of season two. I like that they're longer episodes too. Uh, the fact that there's only eight and they tend to be, you know, an hour and 15, give or take. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that that's, it's a big enough bite. The fact that they're longer episodes makes them feel less episodic, if that makes sense, and more like mm -hmm. chapters that are kind of like overlapping and going one into the other. And like, as you spend a little bit of time with, you know, one storyline in one episode, you get a lot more of that storyline in the other, you know, as you're talking about Numenor. I did find it strange that the eagle showed up and everybody was like, oh yeah, Farazad. It's like when they just said like <laughs> her father had an eagle at his coronation and it was supposed to be this miraculous sign. The fact that it's her coronation and an eagle showed up doesn't tip everybody off that maybe they should stick with the <laughs> with the queen. And 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 when Farazad approaches it, it looks like kind of panicked. It looks like a bird that's trying to be like, no, get away. And mm. then everyone's like, yeah, see, the eagle showed up for Farazad. And like, yeah, I think it's, it's really funny that the eagle's body language seems to be like, I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> like mm -hmm. what are you talking about get away like don't come any closer with that sword that you just drew or whatever like, i kind of wish the funny. eagles spoke yeah they do in the hobbit right like they actually i think they talk to characters because the the eagles are meant to be messengers of the valar they're like you know they're, they're kind of there basically to swoop in when the fighting is done and to sort of bring good tidings and whatnot and so yeah the the, the eagles maybe it's a sign that the people of numenor have kind of you know, started to think too much for themselves and have gotten out of touch with the spiritual side and can't hear the voices of the messengers of the Valar anymore. Like, and it just appears like a common beast to them instead of a messenger from, you know, the people who gifted them this land. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of like meaning you can draw out of moments like that. 
Well, going forward, I'm really looking forward to the confrontation eventually between Galadriel and Sauron because uh, Morfith Clark is just fantastic and I think has already kind of communicated so far in the season her regret and sorrow at being fooled and her passion for rectifying that. She feels responsible to then seek out and, and defeat Sauron. And, and again, like the fact that she feels so so solo in that act that rather than recruiting, she seems to be hell bent on doing it herself. Uh, come hell or high water, and I feel like that again is like a, a, one of those tools that Sauron uses. Like he makes you so upset with him that you want to lash out impatiently, and that is ultimately not the way to defeat him. Like you really have to pool all of your resources at once. And um, I'm looking forward to to that. I think is probably my bi- my big takeaway for the season is how they're going to really come to terms with that and of course i'm just i'm a fan of the stranger i i'm always been a big gandalf fan and i know that there's no real reveal there but the similarities to me are just fun and again feel like home remind me of the the peter jackson series so i'm on board for basically anything that they're going to do to give us more information about the stranger and how nori and poppy and the stranger kind of evolve throughout this this series even on um on imdb the wizard is just billed as dark wizard. There's no real indication yeah. as to what or who that could be. I never gave it much thought in terms of the witch king of Angmar. I thought that was just one of the nine men that was appointed the leader of the ringmates. I never gave much thought to one of those rings going to a wizard. Yeah. Because I thought that would be very strange because because wizards are essentially like Bayar taken human form. So yeah, I... I didn't realize that one of Sauron's rings could be given to a Meyer. And again, like once I found out through, through my own research that Gandalf has one of the rings of power. It's like, okay, well that's interesting because, <laughs> because Gandalf yeah. didn't get corrupted though. So like it's, it's a weird kind of web of who has what and who is corrupted by what. There, there are a few other candidates for who the witch King could ultimately be, but the lore of the Witch King is, I believe, that he was dabbling in dark magic before ever, like, becoming a ringwraith, basically. So, mm. has power of a certain kind, and magic power is relatively rare in Tolkien's cosmology. Like, a lot of the time it is the work of, you know, uh, extra planar beings like the Maiar and the Valar, as opposed to, like, mortal men. There might be some stuff that you could dabble in, and there's certain magic to, like, smithing, and some of the stuff the elves do can be considered magical, but it's sort of like the explanation you get in the Thor movie of, like, what you think of as magic, I think of as science. And there's there's some elements of that that, like, there is mystical stuff happening, but doesn't necessarily mean magic in the strictest sense. And yeah, I, I think it, it's going to be really interesting to see where some of that stuff comes together, but presumably throughout the course of whatever five seasons they have planned we're going to start finding out who all of these characters are and what their role is to play in the established stories that we already know where those connections start to be made that's the stuff that's interesting to me and we know that elendil and isildur have a big role to play in the battle against sauron at the end of the second age and the formation of gondor and the realms of men that we know in the third age so I'm really interested in their story, like when Isildur is going to be reunited with Elendil, who currently, I'm pretty sure, just thinks Isildur is dead and is having to deal with the fact that his only daughter is the one who seems to be supporting this uprising against the queen that he's sworn to protect. And like, there's there's so many little interesting political side notes going on when we're not necessarily used to politics being a key factor of a story like Lord of the Rings. So I think it's it's interesting that the show is taking that approach, probably... Uh, you know, spurred on by the success of political shows, you know, Game of Thrones, The West Wing, even like the kind of stuff that, you know, a, a little bit of a twist of the knife every now and again is going to be comfortable territory with audiences. Moving on into the Internet Minute, which is, of course, brought to you by you, dear listener. The Citadel Cafe is 100% listener supported. If you're getting value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member-only Discord server, which is shared with my personal Discord, and access to the Barista Cut bonus audio sessions, which are the extended version of the podcast that we record from time to time. Special thanks go out to our Bean Counter patrons, Cosmic and Smurf588. Thank you ever so much for your support of this episode. Patron count is at 24. That is steady on from the last time we recorded. 
Our goal each time we sit down is to have one more patron. If you'd like to be patron number 25, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. My pick this week is Tolkien related. I have been watching these videos from Realms Unraveled on YouTube. They are part of a playlist called Middle Earth Explained. It's a series of 15 to 30 minute videos explaining specific aspects of Middle Earth and the lore created by Tolkien. And some of them are really, really specific, like what do the Rings of Power actually do? What does Sauron actually look like? Where is Sauron now? Uh, what's a Balrog? So I, I really have enjoyed watching these. They are expertly narrated. There's not a lot of guesswork. A lot of times there are examples from Tolkien's writing that are quoted on screen and then say, okay, well, if we know A and we know B, we can kind of infer C from these two pieces of information because we know what a Maiar is or what a Valar is or what a wizard is, all that kind of stuff. And I've really been enjoying it. It's very easy to listen to. They're dense. There's a lot of information in them. So sometimes uh, you have to kind of pay attention and maybe even watch them twice to really kind of grasp it. Uh, but the fun part of them is that they are accompanied by a lot of concept art. It's just this visual companion of like, this is what it might look like. And what I like so much about that is that you can tell immediately that it's an artist's interpretation. Some of them are a lot tighter than others. Like sometimes like, oh, that's very much a human face. Uh, or other times it's like, no, that's kind of like this weird smoky thing. And someone taking a description of, of a Balrog from Tolkien's texts, literally, and only painting what was said versus bringing in their own interpretations of demons and fire and all that stuff. And I, I really enjoy them. I think they're worth a, a watch. Certainly worth a watch if you're a little confused on some of the stuff that's happening in Rings of Power, because these go into like the deeper lore, but then they also say, oh, in the Peter Jackson films, you probably saw this represented as this. And you go, oh, okay, well, I know what that is. And now I can make sense of these other things and these other ways that it might have been portrayed and how the Rings of Power are perhaps interpreting that. And I think it's a really good way to refresh and remind yourself that the Rings of Power is an interpretation and they're going to be doing some things differently than Peter Jackson did just because Peter Jackson did an interpretation of the Lord of the Rings. And I think it's, it's, a good way to kind of keep your mind open, but also like give yourself some extra information where I feel like sometimes the rings of power leans a little heavy on the fact that you might be more steeped in Tolkien lore than the average person. And sometimes it's a little bit too subtle. And if you're not, you kind of get lost. And I think that these, these videos that I've found have really helped me watching rings of power. I will have to check those out. I've been diving back into a little bit more fandom discussion of lord of the rings and its associated universe because obviously rings of power has got us all back into it uh my pick this week uh is something that takes us from epic fantasy into medieval music i recently bought the teenage engineering ep 1320 medieval which describes itself as the world's first medieval electronic instrument it is a sampler composer sequencer groove box kind of device with a medieval sound set I recommend looking it up if you're interested at all in making electronic music. It's a really fun gadget. I have a couple of teenage engineering things that I got in the past. They make these little pocket calculator sized little sequencers called pocket operators, which are really fun to doodle around with. But in a previous life, I had something of a musical background. And so I decided to get hold of this to see if I could make some music for upcoming Dungeons and Dragons campaigns and stuff like that. It is an absolute riot. If you don't feel like picking it up yourself, at least do yourself the favor of going to the website, taking a look around, checking out the trailer for it, which is absolutely wild looking, but also seeing what folks on YouTube have made during their time with it, because there's a lot of demos and interesting kind of videos out there of people building up uh, a beat, uh, like a house track and, you know, other types of music that they can make all just using the onboard medieval inspired samples so there are hurdy-gurdies instead of synthesizers there are people screaming and the sounds of swords swishing instead of the usual vocal samples it's an absolute riot so uh yeah give that a look that's the teenage engineering ep 1320 medieval well that wraps up this episode of the citadel cafe you can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that johnny and i talked about at the citadelcafe.com Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email us at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com or find the show by name on social media. 
Subscribe for free on all the major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. The RSS feed and the show notes are available on our website. And that's again, thecitadelcafe.com. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find links to everything that I am up to online at joelduggan.com. That includes my other podcast about Minecraft with this guy, Johnny, at thespawnchunks.com. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Wednesday through Saturday at 1 p.m. Atlantic, although we are adding extra streams now that Satisfactory is launching in 1.0 on the 10th. That's less than a week away. Johnny, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. This was super, super fun. Uh, we always have a, a good time in our render distance extended versions on the Spawn Chunks talking about nerdy stuff. But to really dive into Rings of Power with you is always, always a pleasure. Where can people find you and the other stuff that you're doing online? As usual, uh, my name is Johnny. The internet knows me as Pixorus. You can find me on YouTube, youtube.com slash Pixorifs. I do a show called The Minecraft Survival Guide. I'm dipping into Minecraft snapshots here and there. I also stream Minecraft three days a week on Twitch, where I also do a bit of Elden Ring from time to time. That's at twitch.tv slash Pixorifs. I'm Pixorifs on Twitter and Instagram. I use both relatively infrequently these days, but it's always nice if you want to drop by and say hi. Uh, that's more or less it from me but thanks again for having me it's been a pleasure and uh, i'm sure we will be able to fit in a recap of the whole season once season two concludes so stay tuned because i might be back on in a couple of episodes time oh absolutely yeah we are definitely going to be talking about the the end of the season i'm i'm excited i think this is going to be a a fun ride you've been listening to the citadel cafe where we are fast easy and cheap but you can only pick two two rings to rule them all (laughs) 